This was my favorite moment from Dragon Ball Super. And so, apart from the glaringly obvious on the surface, I wanted to figure out why this scene works so well and why that music fits so perfectly. Throughout my years covering Dragon Ball and countless hours online discussing it, one vital component to its worldwide success oftentimes failed to receive the appreciation it deserved. And trust me, I'm one of those people too, because I totally failed to fully appreciate and observe it. And that aspect I'm talking about is music. More specifically, the soundtrack. Now, I know what you're thinking. Mark, I've grown up with the show. I've spent so much time listening to the music. I've heard all the songs. And yeah, okay, I get it. I can sing all the lyrics to Chala Head Chala too. You're not special. But now, after taking a closer look, the staggering amount of detail and planning that goes into so many films, TV shows, and musicals is honestly jaw-dropping. And despite the fact I've spent tons of time committed to the narrative side of Dragon Ball, as it happens, I've yet to tip the iceberg in the music department. Today, I will be exploring Dragon Ball Super's music Music and why it's more important than you think. Dragon Ball Super Broly was critically acclaimed across the board from an animation standpoint, but also from a musical. Alright, that track might have been a little more experimental and divisive, but my point is, Dragon Ball Super Broly's soundtrack was viewed as leaps and bounds ahead of Dragon Ball Super's, particularly its earlier stuff. And that's with good reason. Tracks like Omen of Victory and Turning the Tables in Dragon Ball Super are not only tracks that more often than not were poorly placed within the anime by the directors, but they were also clearly designed to project a more kid-friendly vibe within the story. And that's important to understand, but I'll get into that a little later, because some people seem to have this idea that Sumitomo, the composer who was enlisted to create the music for one of the biggest intellectual properties on the planet in Dragon Ball, suddenly started to get good at creating music halfway through his time on the series. Which just flat out isn't true. But anyway, so Dragon Ball Super's musical score was heavily criticized in the earlier arcs due to its evidently poor implementation, lobbing the blame largely on the individual creating it until if Eventually, the standard became evidently elevated. Now gee, where have I heard that before? Something starting off bad in Dragon Ball Super but slowly getting better over the course of the series only to crescendo at the Broly movie? Oh yeah! It's the animation! For years now, I, as well as countless others, have spoken at length about the hardships the animation department suffered during the production of Super. And back in the distant past of 2015, talk on the mainstream level regarding animation and the development of which within the industry was criminally low, so it was an important conversation to have and I'm glad we had it. But music way too often gets left out of that conversation or forgotten entirely, despite it being a casualty of Super's ridiculous production schedule also. You heard me, Sumitomo did not have enough time to create a soundtrack for Dragon Ball Super. Or at least, not enough time to create the soundtrack that he wanted. And there's proof of this. If you look at his work before he started working on Kai or Super, the tracks that he was making sounded remarkably similar to what he ended up making towards the end of the Super series and in Broly. I mean, if you really think about it, there's even more working against the musical score of Dragon Ball Super because Sumitomo doesn't even get to place the music himself. That goes to the directors of individual episodes who think that this is an appropriate track to play while Vegeta is charging his Gallic gun. This is not the song you use when your protagonist is up against a literal wall and struggling against difficult odds. And there's literally no excuse for this because a much more appropriate track was already available for that scene. And I know this because they used that very intense track in episode 6 when Goten and Trunks were having a water gun fight. The reason why this bothers me so much isn't just because the atmosphere or vibe portrayed through the music doesn't match what's on screen, but also because if done well, which as we've seen with the Broly movie can be the case, if a score is given enough time to be developed, they can tell a story using that music too. And this is where I introduce many of you to a musical technique used in stories called Johaku, the leitmotif. A leitmotif is defined as an uncomplicated musical phrase or theme that represents a person, place, or idea within the story. The idea behind the implementation of leitmotifs within modern media by and large is to create a correlation between recurring concrete aspects of a story and the soundtrack. This in turn helps people identify what score represents what aspect of the film as well as help people better understand the story at large in some cases. Think of it as the music helping you to better understand the story, and this might sound horribly complicated, but I assure you it's 
not. Take this for example. In the original Dragon Ball story, the musical arrangement that accompanies the visuals has become widely known as the Kikuchi score, named after the man himself who composed it, Mr. Score. I'm kidding, it's... Kikuchi. This is an example of a score that was given the appropriate time to prepare interesting melodies for, and in the case of this example, light motifs. This is King Piccolo's theme, as most of you might be familiar with it. If you're not, listen up, because here it is. Piccolo's most significant section of Dragon Ball story from a narrative point of view can be seen from the King Piccolo saga through to the Saiyan saga. As soon as King Piccolo appears as an old Namekian in the King Piccolo saga, Kikuchi lays the groundwork for his leitmotif. This sounds significantly different to the one I showed you before, though the feeling is still sort of there. It gets across the evil intent, but it's slow. It feels like it's building up to that melody, but it just can't quite do it. Communicating to us that he's not King Piccolo in this form, he's not complete. And this is perfectly representative of the plot too. At this point in the story, Piccolo is spending all of his resources and efforts to become young and powerful again. And once he does, we finally hear it. His leitmotif. <laughs> As soon as he assumes this form, the true King Piccolo leitmotif plays. There's significantly higher notes, it's faster, and the melody line finishes in a really satisfying way. And in the same way the melody is fully realized, so too is King Piccolo. But this is where it gets interesting. Piccolo Jr.'s is different again. Once again, keeping the same melody line, it employs a much faster and playful tone, getting across that there's a fundamental element to this character that is the same, but that he is much younger again, and most importantly, is his own person. And as the show progresses, so too did the theme until the most pivotal moment in Piccolo's life, his time spent with Gohan. Even without the context of the scene, if someone just played the music for you, while you would recognize it as Piccolo's leitmotif, it communicates a much softer, heartfelt approach. And musically, this is very important for the series. The music in this instance isn't just dressing for the scene to match the tone, it communicates part of the story, Piccolo's internal struggle and change to the side of good. Even without the context of this scene, if someone just played this music for you, while you would recognize it as Piccolo's leitmotif, it communicates a much softer, heartfelt approach. Standing in harsh contrast with Piccolo Jr.'s fast and pitchy rendition from earlier in the series, this communicates that Piccolo is changing, or in this case, has changed. And that's the strength of the leitmotif. It's a piece of music that represents something concrete within the story and helps to communicate story elements to the audience as a result. If you weren't aware of this, then welcome. I hope you enjoy stories much more now. But the point that I'm trying to make here is musical scores serve much more of a purpose in a scene than just setting the mood. They can, as made evident by what I just demonstrated above, help you better understand what's going on in a scene. In the case of Piccolo, it was his internal struggle to the sight of good, but this technique isn't just limited to the Kikuchi score of Dragon Ball either. The same can be observed with the Falconer score of Dragon Ball Z from the late 90s too. An easy example can be seen with the track Gohan Angers. Initially a variation on a motif associated with Gohan early on in the series, this one really takes on a life of its own in this one pivotal scene in the series as Gohan transforms in front of Cell to win the day. However, this track also is used elsewhere in the series during Gohan's mystic transformation with Boo. Fight you? No, I want to kill you. Throughout the Boo Saga, we're introduced and listened to various other pieces of music for characters such as the Supreme Kai, or even instances where that realm he comes from is of focus. Predominantly, this new aspect of the series in the Kai's and the Other World are represented with a much more synthy sound rather than the traditional instrumentation we've come to expect from Faulkner. And this is largely there to create a distinction musically between new inclusions to the story and the main cast. This adds a fresh atmosphere to the arc, but it also added something wonderful to Gohan's leitmotif. Because the the mystic form had been given to him by the old Kai, it is in part associated with that aspect of the series now. And with this, while the theme of Gohan Angers plays, it is distinct from the Cell Saga's incarnation of the track. It has both ties to Gohan's character and the realm of the Kais. 
Okay, so that's light motifs, and trust me, there's way more to this. There's like diegetic and non-diegetic music in film, and why certain instrumentation sounds good to you because of where you grew up. And heck, I'll hold my hand up, there's still a ridiculous amount of stuff that I still don't understand because I really only started reading about it a month or so ago. But there's still one aspect I need to share with you all that demonstrates how music makes you feel emotion that honestly took me by surprise. And that's contrast. If I were to approach a person on the street and ask them, what sort of music would you put with a sad scene to make it feel more sad? Apart from responding with, get away from me, you weirdo, what do you think the most popular answer among this survey would be? Personally, I would have said sad music, right? I mean, these are scenes that make you cry after all, but as it happens, this actually isn't true at all. With a sad scene, if you want to get the most emotion out of a viewer, uplifting music usually works best. Think about it for a sec. For me, the scene that makes me cry a little more than I'm comfortable to share with you all online is the last episode of Dragon Ball GT. For those of you that aren't familiar with it, the episode is comprised of a series of goodbyes Goku shares with a number of his friends, from Vegeta to Piccolo to Krillin, but usually during this section, I'm able to keep it together. Where I lose it, however, is right in the last scene as Goku walks away through the grounds of the World Martial Arts Tournament, effectively saying goodbye to all of us. Now, fans of GT and this episode will be able to tell you what theme plays during this scene, and it's the opening theme song, Dan Dan Kokoro Hikareteku. Now, those of you that have seen my review of this series, you'll know that I'm not the biggest fan of GT. No, and neither do I, because this is the worst episode of Dragon Ball I've ever seen. Despite this, however, I always enjoyed the GT theme song. Even in my review series, I mentioned how I love the opening because it really captures that sense of grand adventure which Dragon Ball always represented for me. And throughout the series of GT, whenever a pivotal moment came about, you best believe we'd be hearing this theme song in one form or another through various remixes and reimaginings. And instead of many other tranquil or sad tracks that they could have chosen from throughout the series, they decided decided to end it with Dan Dan, and the reason being is contrast. The song that represents adventure and fun now accompanies the scene that represents Goku's adventure ending. And the narrator says as much, this is where the story of Dragon Ball ends. So on top of this track already acting as a leitmotif for adventure and positivity in the series, it can also be used as a mechanism to stand in direct contrast to a quieter and somewhat sad moment, creating a stark comparison in her mind which breeds emotion. But let's get back to Super for now. A good friend of mine, T. Hallams on Twitter and YouTube, in addition to helping me put together the information for this video, also enjoys fixing the musical choices in the early scenes of Super. Check him out, it's honestly amazing what changing the music in a scene to something appropriate can do to elevate it. But something you might notice, however, on that channel is... STOP RIGHT THERE! Apart from one or two strays, the vast majority of his edited scenes cover only material prior to episode 46. And that's because around this time, similar to the animation of the series, the quality started to improve. This is also when Sumitomo made one of the most memorable musical tracks in the entire series. Goku Black is one of the most easily recognizable and memorable characters to come out of Dragon Ball Super, and Sumitomo helped him by giving him an amazingly nefarious villain theme that crawls inside your brain and stays there. It's catchy and it's perfect for the character. And this arc also has another theme I adore too, Zamasu's theme. While significantly more understated than his more Goku-centric counterpart, it's still catchy and encompasses his character perfectly. But one aspect of this arc I thought they didn't capitalize on from a musical standpoint was in the fusion of the two characters, and so I thought it would be fun to commission my friend Pokemixer92 on YouTube and Twitter to create for me a perfect marriage of the two respective themes to create one perfect fused Zamasu theme, implementing elements from both to create something new. And needless to say, he did just that. the almighty and divine. All hail Zamasu. I thought that was sick, and because that one turned out so well, I asked him to make me one more. I thought that since Fuzamasu loses his mind and becomes corrupted physically later on in the story, his theme should reflect that insanity too. And this is what Pokemixer came up with. <laughs> The 
These tracks were really fun to workshop, and if you'd like to see these full clips and scenes with the music unedited, I will upload them onto my Twitter, at TotallyNotMark. All right, enough fooling around. Now that we've got context and understanding regarding some basic fundamentals of music literacy, let's take a closer look at Dragon Ball Super once again. Understanding the purpose music plays in storytelling now, we can with greater understanding appreciate how utterly ridiculous this scene is. The music doesn't communicate anything other than that the directors and staff involved were really scrambling to, at all costs, put an episode together on time. However, when it came to this scene, it absolutely knocked it out of the park for me. And so, using everything we've learned today, let's see if we can, on some level, understand why I loved it so much. The track is distinctly Dragon Ball Super. None of the other series discussed sound anything like it, which helps the story being told have its own identity. But that's just superficial surface dressing. Those of you that have been paying attention will also notice that this track is in and of itself a leitmotif. But what does it represent and where did it come from? The track backing up this scene you might recognize is a remix of the main theme of the universe survival arc, Limit Break X Survivor. Listen carefully. <laughs> In the same way Dragon Ball GT implemented its own theme in pivotal moments to harken back to something familiar, so too does this track work in that way. Well, the story being told in this arc is that of Universe 7 needing to band together with unlikely comrades to defend their own universe from Erasure in a multiverse team oriented battle to end all battles. And this variation of the theme is played not just here but in a few other instances to reinforce the fact that this track represents trust and teamwork. The first obvious one comes in episode 109 as Goku begins calling on his team to lend him their energy for one of his signature finishing moves, the Spirit Bomb. Because this is one of the first notable inclusions of this track in the series, this particular piece of music has become widely known as the Genki Dama theme on YouTube. But it is in fact a leitmotif derived from the original OP that not only has nothing to do with this scene specifically, but also has nothing to do necessarily with Spirit Bombs. For example, another instance that this track makes an appearance for is during the closing moments of one of my favorite favorite scenes concerning Piccolo and Gohan in the series. Downed and trying to rally themselves, Piccolo looks on as Gohan has his back and together they finally overpower the team of Universe 6's Namekians thanks to their combined efforts. These scenes with the spirit bomb and the team up of Gohan and Piccolo gave me chills but they didn't really invoke the same sort of visceral reaction or emotion that the scene in the final episode did and that is primarily due to contrast. I spoke about this briefly during my breakdown of this scene in my review of the arc, but it's worth repeating for the sake of this point. No! 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 The entire crux of this scene leans heavily on the story being told by Frieza in this arc. And this scene, this conversation with Goku, acts as its climax. Throughout the tournament, he has really been working on his own, unable to fight alongside others, oftentimes only contributing to the action in the latter stages by blindsiding the antagonists before ultimately being kicked to the sidelines to lick his wounds. And by the time the final battle comes around, he's made it known that he clearly struggles to work alongside others. Reinforced by the dialogue, he screams towards Seventeen, who is only trying to keep him alive. He doesn't want to rely on anyone because he can't try trust anything anyone says. In his mind, he'd betray them, so why would they not do the same to him? This way of thinking is what makes sense to Frieza, made obvious by his responses to Seventeen's restricted but sincere words aimed towards him in episode 131. <laughs> Despite looking down on this sort of behavior as a weakness, the battle suddenly takes a turn for the worst. Jiren, now fueled by a new motivation, finds hidden reserves of strength, forcing Frieza to have to hide behind the defenses of his ally, 17. Kicking and screaming, Frieza is forced to shed his gaudy golden exterior and is forced to relinquish his dwindling energy reserves to 17's shield to defend them both. But just like Frieza feared and suspected, this trust isn't enough. The shield is seconds from breaking, and it's looking like trust and teamwork is nothing in the face of absolute power. <laughs> the ethereal music from this track cuts through the air and replaces all the despair we felt leading up to this with hope, as Frieza finally has a conversation about trust with Goku. It's the best conversation in the entire series in my opinion, and this track reinforces every single aspect of this scene, made all the more powerful because as viewers we are so invested in the conclusion to this upcoming conflict. We've no idea who's going to win, and in a way we too have to put our trust in this unlikely team. It's a wonderfully crafted piece of music that not only up 
uplifts this scene, but creates a gorgeous contrast with the most unlikely teammates of Goku and Frieza, and implements a reliable leitmotif we've made a connection with during the tournament. And that is why this scene is my favorite in the series. And if you're still not convinced that this scene or this arc is about teamwork or trust, just check out Jiren's final words when he's defeated at the Tournament of Power. So this is trust, Universe 7's power. Over my years on this channel, I've spoken at length about the animation troubles and woes of Dragon Ball Super, as well as the narrative quality and shortcomings of the series at length, as have countless others across YouTube and the internet at large. The topic has become so ubiquitous that it's honestly difficult to find an instance on Twitter where someone brings up the animation quality of the series without someone at least mentioning the reasons behind it once in the underlying comments. And this is a great thing. For an audience to be so educated about a particular topic is commendable, and it's honestly one of the best things about living in the modern age to me. When someone says that Dragon Ball Super's animation was terrible, there's plenty of people right there to provide the facts. But this is no different to the music of the series. When someone says that Sumitomo is a terrible composer, there are comparatively fewer to jump to the defense of this fantastic artist that too struggled against the clock, as well as other heavy factors. It's easy to notice great animation when we see it. It's flashy and it's bombastic, but rarely can we say the same about music. If a musical score is doing its job, oftentimes we don't even notice it. As it it seamlessly integrates itself into our subconscious in an effort to tell a compelling story. And so as viewers and fans, it's our responsibility to recognize when it's in trouble and to appreciate when they show themselves the pockets of hidden genius in Dragon Ball's music. I want to give a special thanks to T. Hallams who helped me with so many of the specifics in this video. Without him, this wouldn't have happened. Special thanks also goes out to Pokemixer92 for creating some of these custom themes in the video like the Fuse Zamasu theme and the Corrupted Fuse Zamasu themes. Check both T. Hallams and Pokemixer out on YouTube and Twitter. Also, if you found this particular dive into musical score theory interesting, I couldn't recommend a channel on YouTube called Sideways More. He specializes in music video essays, goes into way more detail than I ever could, and I honestly think he makes some of the best video essays on the platform, period. Check him out if you haven't already. But as for me, next week I begin a new adventure through the crazy world of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, and I can't wait to share it with you all. This one will be much, much shorter than the One Piece series, and I hope you all can join me for the ride to see what all the hype is about. And to make things a little bit more interesting, the author of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure has actually made a how-to-write book discussing his approach to narrative theory. So let's see how the early work stands up against his own standards, and let's see if this Bizarre Adventure will be a great one. I'll see you all there, but until then, I've been totally not Mark, and thank you so much for watching.